and um, good afternoon to this webinar 50th anniversary of the Nixon Mao meeting US China relations then and now organized by the School of Security Studies um, and the strategic studies research team and the Lao Institute um, from the Glo School for Global Affairs by um, King's College London. Um, some people are still dropping in so we will um, just wait a few more minutes and then um, we can kick it off. So thank you very much for the moment um, for joining us today. And um, we are very much looking forward to this, um, to this event. Yeah, we're getting more and more in here. Also knowing that some are dialing in from the other side of the Atlantic where it's still quite early or potentially also from China. Um, just as a late night event there today. But I see that it looks like we have a critical mass. So um, I would say let's kick it off. So once again, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this virtual roundtable on the 50th anniversary of the Nixon Mao meeting, um, US-China relations then and now. And um, as I already said, um, of course, also good morning to everyone dialing in from the other side of the Atlantic and good evening to everyone joining us um, from China um, today. It's a pleasure to all to have you with us here today, um, no matter from where you are joining for that very timely subject. Because even if um, the headlines are currently, of course, dominated by the current uh, crisis in Ukraine, there is very little doubt that US-China relations will be the determining variable of international relations in the next years and probably decades. And that is why we are discussing that topic, not only because of the anniversary, but also because it's going to be the pressing challenge for scholars working on international relations as well as policymakers. Um, as of course, this approach to US-China relations requires a comprehensive perspective and also um, different strands of research, different um, points of view. Um, we decided to join forces to, for this webinar together um, on the one hand with um, the School of Security Studies, more precisely the Strategic Studies Research theme um, from King's College London, which is um, one of the biggest communities worldwide of scholars um, of interdisciplinary research working on war, conflict, um, peace and strategy. And on the other hand, the Lao China Institute, which is part um, of the School of Global Affairs and offers a wide range um, of courses and research that explore contemporary China um, as well as its role in the world. And um, the most recent example of this has been um, the China Week of the Institute, which, may, which maybe some of you had the possibility to join um, a few weeks ago. Um, understanding China-US relations then and now um, does not only require an interdisciplinary understanding, but also um, for us, it is very important to have different perspectives of, of research in terms of seniority. And that's why um, it's our special pleasure to have put together a comprehensive roundtable that is not only from two institutes, but also brings together very established scholars and junior PhD researchers, um, both from the School of Security Studies and the Lao China Institute of King's College London. Um, just a quick reminder before we are kicking it off, this webinar is live and recorded and if you wish to participate or ask questions, please do so using the function on the bottom of your screen. Lastly, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our moderator here today, Vincent Ni, who is China Affairs Correspondent at The Guardian and um, one of today's keenest China watchers. Um, in the UK and abroad. Um, he has previously reported uh, for the BBC from Asia, Europe and North America and is, and is therefore very well um, positioned to lead us through today's discussion with um, his insight and um, also to take your questions, um, whatever you might have. So um, all I can say at this point is 
thanks again very much for joining us today. Thanks, Vincent, and over to you. Thanks very much, Jessie. And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this panel discussion that looks back at Richard Nixon's visit to China 50 years ago and asks, what next? for the world's most consequential bilateral relations. Now, the event half a century ago this week sent shockwaves around the world. Those who were involved in it still hold the view that it was a brilliant strategic move and both sides have benefited from it. But 50 years on, people are asking also, what was the real lesson from Nixon's historic handshake with Chairman Mao? How do we get to where we are today? And most importantly, what next? So without further ado, let me bring you um, our first speaker, Professor Carrie Brown. Carrie, um, just let, let's start off this conversation by asking you, how did we get to where we are today and what went wrong? Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, so it's exactly 50 years ago, I think, today that Nixon landed in uh, Beijing um, and was met, I believe, uh, by, I think it was Joe Lai. Uh, he didn't know if he was going to have a meeting with Mao Zedong, uh, but that did happen. Uh, and it was extremely important for him uh, to show that the visit had been a success. I think he was in China at all for quite a long time, about nine days. Um, and of course, historically, it meant uh, that the Shanghai communique was signed. Uh, it set in place policies on, for instance, the One China policy and things like this, which are still current today. I think there are three things that the visit set out which are still relevant. I think the first is that it made pragmatism a core between China and the United States. Nixon was famously sharply critical uh, during the Cold War and had taken a strong stance on opposing communist countries and had been extremely critical of China until about 1968 when he famously produced, I think in foreign policy, an article arguing that you could not keep China out of the global order. And the pragmatism, I think, meant that he was able to talk to also a leader who had taken a strong stance against the capitalist West, Mao Zedong. Uh, putting these two figures together was incredibly unlikely until it actually happened. But I think it showed the power of pragmatism and the fact that that is still important. If Nixon and Mao could speak to each other at the time they did with the backgrounds they had, pretty much anyone can. And I think we have to remember that symbolism of the uh, visit even today. The second, I suppose, is probably more contentious and that is the underlying drivers of the relationship right from the beginning, for the US at least, were marge, largely about opening up a whole new market and business opportunities, even though during Nixon's visit, of course, it couldn't easily talk about these things because China was commercially largely closed. I think the aim was that one day this would be a significant new market. And indeed, by 1979, that opportunity came. And in fact, Nixon played a role even after he resigned from the presidency in that once he'd been marginally rehabilitated right up until the 1990s. I suppose the third question is, well, did it change anything? If this visit had never happened, what would have changed? Um, I mean, that's a huge question. You can't prove counterfactuals, but I suppose we could say that, although we think today about how do you influence China's behavior when it's so complicated and often seems that China is so uh, strong on the global change stage, I think that, the 1972 visit did have a profound impact on China on, uh, you know, and probably not in any planned way, because it meant after Mao's death in 1976, and then the beginning of new policies from 1979, the option was to develop these with the relationship with America and have that relationship not been in place uh, I don't think this would have been remotely, uh, well, it, it wouldn't have been easy, whether it would have been possible, whether it would have been, it would have been much, much harder. Uh, China and the United States didn't have full diplomatic recognition of each other until 1979. And I think 
the fact that Nixon had taken an enormous gamble meant that China could change in the ways that it wanted to after 1979. Finally, on the assessments, Nixon himself expressed some reservations before his death in the 1990s about whether it had created a kind of monster that had never been expected. I mean, I think it's hard to assess this properly. Uh, many Chinese today, if you look, for instance, at comments, Mike Pence, for instance, the former vice president made recently, and uh, Pompeo, the former secretary of state, in opening the Nixon Library late last year, they use this strange language of we uh, created, you know, we were the ones that reached out to China, opened up opportunities for China, and, you know, kind of it didn't live up to our expectations. It didn't um, reward what we did in the right way. It didn't act uh, fairly. I think that that's a strong claim, but it's emotionally quite a powerful one in contemporary America. The idea that, in a sense, they had taken a big risk 50 years ago, and that risk didn't kind of really pan out. I really wonder whether there was much choice about what China and the United States did in 72. I'm not a believer in historical determinism by any means, but I think that was a strong logic for both because of the USSR, but also because of their own internal issues, that at some point after 1949, they would have to have this kind of dialogue with each other. And I think uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves that there was ever uh, more choices than we believe, you know, that, that there were never that many choices about this relationship. And I think that that is uh, true even till today. So those are just some uh, kind of initial comments about this incredibly historically you know, important visit and its meaning 50 years after it happened. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Kerry. Um, Angus, I'd like to turn to you for some context around this trip. Um, a few months before this week that changed the world, as some historians call Nixon's trip later on, there was a secret visit by Kissinger's national security advisor, uh, Nixon's, uh, Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, in July 1971. Looking at the kind of diplomacy that was conducted back then in the early 1970s between the two countries, and looking at the diplomacy between the two countries today, do you see any similarities at all? Well, well, thank you, Vincent, for that question. And thank you to everyone for being on this panel. It's a brilliant opportunity. And obviously, it's a unique week in geopolitics. We are reminded of another um, continued relevance to the Cold War in contemporary geopolitics. And also that Kissinger quote that, you know, when I don't have time for a crisis this week, my schedule's already too full. And so we'll just take this opportunity to look a little bit deeper at um, the, uh, this anniversary, the week that changed the world as it's known. And Kissinger, as you say, is really central to this. Henry, Henry Kissinger would not be Henry Kissinger to us without the secret trip to China in July 1971. And I do not believe that we would consider um, US-China relations uh, this, in the same way if it was not for Henry Kissinger, not just because of that original trip, but because of his enduring legacy. And he turns 99 this year. He's producing another book um, at the moment, which is essentially a set of biographies of people he's known, one of whom will be Mao Zedong. And he's been to China at least 60 times since leaving office. He is ultimately the seen as, seen as the ultimate sage of uh, US grand strategy related to China. And so it is worth examining how he approached that in time and what was he considering, what was he thinking about in 1971 to 1972. And firstly, I think it's important to acknowledge that the opening to China was not as radical as many people actually say. Um, Britain was moving towards it, Canada had had engagements with China as well, and Kissinger himself in 1970 said that an opening was, was quote, inherent to the world environment of the 1970s. And he then obviously went to China in July 1971, hope with a, cert, with a set of aims. And those aims, I think, his goals there are sort of a good reference point for how we approach US-China relations now. Because I think that there were, that one can interpret what Kissinger was trying to do in two ways. It was firstly about widening the scope of international politics and global order in the 1970s, about 
incorporating China as an acknowledged great power into the international discourse. Um, in the context of detente with the Soviet Union concurrently, but also a shifting balance of power towards Asia and a shift in um, US priorities, both milit militarily and economic in the early 1970s. And also this trip takes place only a few months after the collapse of Bretton Woods. I know it is very much on the mind of US policymakers that they are going to be near, need to reshape the international order to incorporate Asia more properly. So it's both an element of triangular diplomacy, as Kissinger called, called it, and also trilateralism, that neologism that was so popular in the 1970s about balancing um, between the United States, Europe, and Asia. But then there was an el another element to um, Kissinger's trip that I think has particular re relevance, because it was not just about widening the scope of global order, but it was about deepening um, US engagement with its issues. Because a central aim of the trip to China was for the, was that Nick, Nixon and Kissinger hoped that the um, Chinese government would be able to put pressure on the North Vietnamese in the ongoing Paris negotiations over the Vietnam conflict. And um, this was a really, this was a really um, important motivation for Kissinger and Nixon. And there was also um, the element that they wanted this China to balance against the Soviet Union as well. So they want um, essentially to develop another alliance system against the balance, um, against its traditional enemy. And Kissinger um, famously says, and I have a quote here in a book, so the deepest international conflict in the world today is not between us and the Soviet Union, but between the Soviet Union and communist China. So Kissinger was looking at the Cold War and it's the proxy conflicts associated with it through the prism of China. And that I think is probably the bit where he most failed. Ultimately, the more degrees of separation between Kissinger and his goal, um, the less success he had. The Chinese did not have um, particular authority um, over the uh, North Vietnamese government, and they could not really extract um, particular leverage out of them. And ultimately, of course, China goes to war in Vietnam in the late 1970s. And then, and then the, the extent to which the Soviet Union does, the, the China does balance against the Soviet, Soviet Union in the 1970s is quite limited. Ultimately, detente manifested in nuclear arms um, races and in nuclear arms agreements, but also proxy conflicts in places like Africa. And what does this tell us about the situation today? I think it's important. I think it's important. Well, the biggest lesson is actually that we, we acknowledge China very much in its own terms now. We do not consider China as a means to anything. I don't really believe that the US is currently pressuring China in order to, in order to have this, the Russia withdraw troops from the border with Ukraine. That just doesn't happen anymore. We acknowledge China for what it really is, which is the emerging superpower um, of contemporary politics. And, um, and I think that's the, the most considerable lesson. For Kissinger himself, he has always been someone very much focused on the lessons of history and as a historian of international relations, particularly the First World War. Now he is the one of the first earliest articulators of the ideas of the Thucydides trap. And World War I for him was always a great warning for the dangers of international politics. And therefore he is consistent, he is still advocating quite active, proactive diplomacy with the Chinese to an extent that many on the American right uh, disagree with, including Mike Pompeo. And I think that is one of the direct lessons that Kissinger himself has taken from the trip. Um, I mean, just to wrap up my thoughts, I think that there is much one can take from the trip, um, from the two trips in July 71 and January 1972. But it's ultimately all important to recognize what they were on their own terms, which was not, in, and it, it was not, should not be construed in the same paradigm as international relations at present. Ultimately, they are very different situations. And the biggest lesson of history is probably to learn where the difference is than where the similar, similarities are. Thank you.
Great. Thanks very much, Angus. Um, Li, I wanted to turn to you now for a Chinese perspective on this bilateral relationship. These days, there is a prevailing view in Washington that China's era of hide and abide is long gone. And in fact, according to strategists such as Rush Doshi, who now advises President Biden, China has long had this plan to displace America. So others say we are in a new Cold War type of global dynamics, this time featuring China and America. Is this also China's view that we are in this inevitable Cold War or conflict with America? What is China's perspective on this? Thank you, Vincent. Does China have a plan to displace the US? I think it's very unwise for the um, advisors to think that way. There are people who compare the current situation to that of um, last century, before President Nixon's visit to Beijing, which wrote a new page for China-US relations. And also today, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there is a concept that had been created that is the new Cold War. Um, the detente of China-US relation 50 years ago, that decision was made by both sides. Without either, it couldn't work. Um, that was not a romantic whim. It was driven by real political interest. Um, both sides had the will, the communication, and the action. And you can still see interest today, and maybe even more interest. At that time, Nixon wanted to withdraw troops from Vietnam as decently as possible. At the same time, strategic balance was reached between US and SU. And as SU um, at that time even had more nuclear weapons than the US. Uh, while China's strategic change, uh, change started in um, late, late 1960s, actually, after the assessment of the four senior marshals who estimated the contradiction between either China US or US, uh, sorry, between either China SU or US SU is bigger than that between China SU. So the improvement of um, Sino US relations of first of all making both countries safer. So then the United States did not need to fight a second Vietnam War and China did not have to worry about the invasion or threaten from the United States. And the second is to, um, they can step into economic and trade cooperation that brings great benefits to both sides until today. Thus, when it comes to today, the interest is much more than that of then. Um, today's global interdependence, as we all know, um, and shared interest of every country is unprecedented. It seems either the worldwide financial crisis and the unbelievable growth of um, infectious disease cases could be an evidence. Um, what may be somehow unrealized by now is that China and the United States have more cooperation and common interests than ever and then fought. I believe we don't need to read the charts or numbers of profits China and the US have benefited from each other. Um, there are also other shared interests too, for example, in territories, uh, anti-terrorism, sorry, anti-terrorism, nuclear um, non-proliferation, peacekeeping, climate change issues, and everything. China needs a stable environment, and so does the US. So one country needs stable environment to develop and um, for all relations, whether bilateral, multilateral, they all need a stable environment to, to, to maintain. At present day, who can, who can guarantee that your country would be without any trouble forever? So we should be ready to help each other instead of making trouble for each other. So I think community with a shared future is what China understands about the world and the future. After all, the um, intertwine of the world has been so tight, anyone could be a butterfly and you don't know who have a storm next day. And um, China doesn't even regard the United States as an enemy. We might say um, before the 1970s, the United States was the enemy of China, but not after even now. China-US relations seem to be very tense um, now, but China 
will see um, the China may see the United States as a potential enemy if the United States interfered in the Taiwan issue, threatening China's territory and sovereignty. Um, but if you ask me whether there is going to be um, whether an intention of China to displace the, U the United States or there's uh, intention to have new Cold War, I think the answer is absolutely no, because um, as I said, the um, uh, interdependence has been much more than what we have realized. And I say the advice that China has planned to displace uh, US is unwise because um, what I, I can see the shared interest is much more than ever. Don't they know this? And don't they know this will only bring tension, which is not helpful um, from every perspective? So um, now there are so many different political views in the United States criticizing each other. Maybe the only consensus in US Congress would be taking a hard stance on China, and thus China issue becomes even more tricky there. Um, if taking a hard stance on China is the easiest consensus to reach, then they will use it to, you know, barely making people unite. But I think it's also possible that US is just saying that, but um, it's very similar half centuries ago that um, the great powers are saying things, but they are not, you know, really taking actions. So I think, no, uh, I don't think there will be new Cold War. And um, strategically or not, China doesn't have a plan to displace the US. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Lee. Um, we'll come back to more of uh, Chinese perspective later. Um, Next, I want to turn to Nicola. Um, Nicola, last week when I spoke to Winston Lord, who was at present with Chairman Mao, with President Nixon and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger in, on that trip, um, I asked him to respond to critics of Nixon's visit. And he touted the fact that shortly after Nixon's trip to China, the US made significant progress with the Soviets on things like arms control agreement, et cetera. But these days, with big power competition beginning to intensify, and many are also worried the new arms race. Do you also see this happening as well? Thanks, Vincent, and thanks to the organizers. I think I'm still relatively optimistic about present day and near future um, prospects of, 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 of an arms, arms race. Um, but I think the context that you talk about is, is really really relevant and quite important because um, at the time of the visit, uh, a lot of negotiations around nuclear weapons and, and controlling these weapons and reducing these weapons and restricting them, they were going on in the background. Um, and ultimately a, a very important treaty was concluded in 72, which was the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. And that treaty actually came to an end in 2003. Uh, but it was a crucial treaty. It um, gave huge momentum to wider um, arms control treaties between the United States and the Soviet Union. So the, the, the broader normalization, as you, as you hinted, did, did um, take place um, amid a backdrop of major change in nuclear terms. So it was a very different moment in history if you think about nuclear arms control um, um, compared to today, where we see a lot of unraveling of, of nuclear arms control agreements, like, for instance, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces that came to an end recently. Um, it was also a time, of course, even before the visit where the United States, um, when it was talking to China, it was also a time where China was still a relatively young nuclear weapon state, right? It tested in 64. So by the time of Nixon's visit in 1972, it was still a very young, very weak nuclear weapon state. And it had also just gone through a relatively harsh experience, you could say, in terms of um, a border conflict with the Soviet Union in 69 during which China experienced very sincere and serious war scare, including potentially threats against its, its nuclear arsenal from the Soviet Union. And many academics actually draw from that 1969 experience 
that that provided great momentum for Mao and Zhou Enlai and others to press ahead um, and be positive um, regarding normalization with the with, um, United States. So there is a, there's a much broader context, and I think you allude to um, in, in your question. Now, you mentioned the 1972 sort of ABM treaty, I think that's what your, what your um, interview alluded to. And, and what is its relevance today? Well, it no longer exists, um, of course, as I said. And I, I think it speaks to a broader problem, namely that there are no legal constraints, no international legal constraints um, at present day um, or, or any discussions towards a legal international legal constraint uh, between the United States and China around strategic arms. In other words, there are no legal impediments to both countries um, developing and increasing the size of their nuclear arsenals and, and, and other associated strategic weapons. There is no um, alternative or uh, US-China specific intermediate nuclear forces treaty. There's no sort, there's no strategic arms limitation talks, there are no uh, ABMs currently under negotiation, and there seems to be very little prospect of any of those things between the United States and China at present. There was an attempt during the Trump administration to bring China into a new start, which is the, the only really existing mechanism between the United States and Russia uh, to limit um, strategic nuclear weapons. Um, but that was um, not necessarily a very sincere attempt. Uh, and had lots of problems and it and, and it wasn't the right platform to bring China in. China was very clear about not wanting to be part of that platform. So there are no, um, I guess you could say positives when you look at the legal side of things and the diplomatic um, side of things. And return to the sort of significance of 1972 and the ABM treaty negotiations that were concluded then. Uh, missile defenses, and that's what the ABM treaty was all about. It was about agreeing that both the United States and the Soviet Union wouldn't pursue, because they had amassed so many nuclear weapons anyway, they wouldn't pursue uh, national level missile defenses that would, in theory, if they worked, cancel out each other's nuclear deterrent. So it was about preserving mutual assured destruction. It was about preserving that awful illogical balance of terror, right? Uh, and sort of embracing and accepting the logic of that. Um, there is, as I said, nothing similar being remotely discussed between the United States and China. The United States resolutely refuses publicly to acknowledge that it has a relationship of mutual vulnerability um, with, with, with China. But missile defenses are at the core of Chinese concerns vis-a-vis -vis, uh, strategic talks with, um, uh, Chuck, with uh, the United States. So moving forward, when we see China, the United States talking about arms control, how you bring missile defenses into that will be, will be pivotal um, and Biden, of course, is now under, under, undergoing a review um, of missile defenses. Um, and the United States and Russia, if they enter into agreements on missile defense, that may put pressure on China um, in the future. So I'll leave it there. Maybe there'll be some more questions about um, that particular topic. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thanks very much, Nicola. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box and then we'll cut to the um, questions and answers session shortly after our last speaker, James. James, um, I wanted to ask you about the economic and the technological competition between China and the US. This is really at the heart of the great power competition today. Now, the Americans complain about China's motors or Peranda in achieving its goals, such as through projects such as Belt on the Road. But on a strategic level, it also has a similar plan called Build Back, Build Back Better 3BW, uh, Build Back Better World. Is this a new gray game going on here uh, in much of the you know, non-Western world or, and beyond? Thank you, Vizant, and uh, thank you to the panel. So it is and it isn't a great uh, new great game. So the old great game was between Russia and China in Central Asia looking, well, sorry, it's between Britain and uh, Russia over empires and boundaries primarily taking part in Central Asia. And it was focused primarily on influence, making sure to maintain boundaries and then access, access for markets, access for trade. So in that, yes, it is sort of a new great game, uh, but it accepts that this time, obviously it's the US and China. And 
instead of spies sort of trying to negotiate diplomatic deals, it's now big economic initiatives, you know, big trade deals, big plans, uh, a lot of speeches, a lot of interaction. So there are sort of aspects to this that obviously take from the old, but it's it's very much a new a new great game, as you say. This isn't particularly new, though, because if we look at both sort of initiatives, we talk about the BRI, everybody knows about the BRI from 2013. Uh, the US had a similar sort of idea, especially in the Central Asian region called the New Silk Road, uh, which was announced in 2011 by Hillary Clinton to sort of connect the Central Asian region with South Asia, stabilize the region, all that sort of thing. Uh, whereas obviously the Built and Road Initiative is very much for China to sort of expand westwards, access new markets, develop infrastructure, develop connections, all that. So it is it is to still access markets, it is to still influence, uh, whereas the US was obviously looking at for a little bit more stability in the region. But there are still aspects where they're, they, they're coming into competition with the, uh, one another. Now, the new Silk Road Initiative by the US was not particularly successful. It had uh, only a few, I think, 20 total projects, most of which were already going on in Afghanistan at the time. And then you had a few others, such as the TAPI pipeline, so the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, natural gas, which actually is about to be completed, but it never saw a dime of US funding. So, you know, it never, although it was a US idea, it never really went anywhere. Uh, the other projects that sort of has been successful as the CASA 1000, so that's Central Asia, South Asia uh, electricity project. So it's basically hydroelectricity in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan developed for selling in the region. And that has been successful and that's, that's, that's good. But then you look comparatively at that success compared to China's investment in railway infrastructure, pipelines themselves, and roads uh, and even business and other uh, other institutions in the central asian region and it's it's <laughs> it's a different scale so we are, we are seeing we are seeing a lot of competition uh not necessarily butting heads at all times uh because i don't think the us is in, invested enough uh, or involved enough to really look to challenge china at this point uh and i think the chinese obviously have their own aims and objectives for this which uh, is played out in, as you say, a national strategy um, towards, I mean, the region. And obviously, I think that a more national strategy for themselves as well, uh, because obviously they want to make sure that they have got economic access to other regions, whereas for the US, it doesn't really affect them quite as much because they're halfway around the world. So we have got this level of competition. Now, going forward, so obviously these sort of initiatives didn't really exist when uh, Nixon first went over to China. But going going forward from now, over the last decade, we've seen these initiatives. The Belt and Road has sort of slowed down a little bit, but it's promised to reinvigorate itself. The Belt and Road, Road 2.0, that's, that's the Chinese plan. They're looking to reinvigorate, sort of reinvest, reposition themselves uh, once again to sort of ensure that the strategic objectives are met. Uh, whereas the US has been looking more an Asia Pacific perspective. So they've come up with the Blue Dot Network, which is Australia, the US and Japan uh, creating a, a governing body to essentially look at infrastructure projects and see where they can associate private investment. So again, they're not really, it's comparing apples and oranges to what the objectives actually are and how things are fitting in. Uh, but there are sort of plans going forward. But we need to be very careful when we say and look at these as strategic initiatives, because often uh, both the US and China have claimed different projects as part of these grand strategic designs. And really, they were just going on to begin with, and they wanted another feather in their cap. So the future's looking good. There does look like investment's going to continue. Uh, there is competition, but it isn't uh, conflicting with one another. And so hopefully this is to the bet betterment of everybody in the end. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, James, um, for this really interesting take on um, economic and uh, technology uh, statecraft. Um, so um, we've got some questions coming to the chat box. Um, 
There's one question about Russia. That's obviously the elephant in the room when we are talking about U.S.-China today, especially this week when the U.S. is embroiling this mind game with Russia, whether or not, or indeed when Putin is going to invade Ukraine. So I wanted to ask our panelists if you have any take on the importance of Russia in today's U.S.-China relations. Um, Kerry, why don't we start from you? Yeah, I mean, um, the uh, Russia-China relationship. I think once I, I think someone described it as, um, in recent years, a relationship between two people, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, <laughs> and at that level, it seems to kind of work fine. Um, so it's transformed from 1972. I mean, if you think in 1969, there was a border clash and the whole drivers, I think a previous speaker said, was the fact that, you know, both the US and China regarded Russia as or the USSR as a bigger strategic threat than, than, than either of, you know, either were to each other. Um, the thing that I always remember about Chinese-Russian relations today is that, and I checked this the other day, uh, the Russian economy is one-sixth the size of the Chinese economy. And I mean, I think that explains everything. Um, there is an excellent book by Caroline Humphrey and Frank Billet uh, from Cambridge University called Along the Border, mm -hmm. which is about the Chinese-Russian border. And I think that also explains very well that for Russia, there are these long-standing fears about how China has big intentions on, for instance, Siberia. They argue in this book that, in fact, um, there's been a, re with a, a reduction of migration from China to uh, Russia because there are so many more opportunities on the Russian border or the, on the Chinese border. Um, there are no operational bridges across the Amur River uh, between Russia and China, which is extraordinary. I think there's one bridge, that's, bridge that has been constructed uh, with Chinese money. Uh, but because of COVID is still um, closed. So, you know, this is a sort of strange relationship. Um, and what's happening, of course, with uh, Ukraine at the moment, um, people argue somewhat strangely that this is relevant to China because it's, um, uh, you, you know, kind of um, might have relevance to Taiwan. I mean, I think that's really stretching things. I don't think that that's um, a kind of decent parallel at all. I think it might be that, China isn't super happy about Russia causing uh, these sorts of disruptions, but it's certainly happy for Russia to be the um, just sort of the, the, the one that gets a lot of the blame, uh, you know, for stirring things up, whereas China, I think, keeps more of a backseat. I think it's a kind of asymmetrical relationship where everything is increasingly on China's terms. But Carrie, if that's the case, why on 4th of February we saw this lengthy statement between the two leaders in which essentially they pledged so-called limitless cooperation between the two countries? Well, you can think of a positive reason for do th doing things, and then you can think of maybe a, a more negative reason. I don't think China and Russia have great strategic alignment. I haven't seen any persuasive argument that says in the medium to long term, they have big strategic alignment. What they do have is common anger and frustration at one common uh, entity, which is the United States or Europe, um, as an actor, you know, kind of as a, as a sort of a servant of the United States. And I think that kind of keeps them lined up with each other. You, you know, mm -hmm. um, in diplomacy, we, we maybe sort of always think of the positive things, you know, why do you mm -hmm. do this? Because you want to achieve that. It's often the negative things. I'm doing this not because I particularly like you, but I like that one even less. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I think um, for China, its issues with the United States in particular, as it becomes a more dominant global power, are worth it working with a power like Russia, because Russia will do things that will also assist in distracting irritating and diluting American power. And I think that's what we see happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, from that point of view, I mean, it's, a, it's not a particularly positive strategy, but it's an opportunistic strategy and China is an opportunist. 
And when it comes to trade, last year the Sino-Russian trade volume was about 140 billion US dollars, whereas China's trade with the European Union was about four or five times higher. So practically China has much to gain from having better relationship with the European Union, right? Yeah, but I mean, is that trade really going to be impacted heavily by what Russia does in yeah. Ukraine? I mean, yeah. I, I think if you're talking about agency, if the Europeans mm. or Americans tomorrow could shift all of their supply lines and their exports away from China, I'm sure they would do it immediately, mm. uh, but they can't. I mean, they've been trying for many years to diversify, and now they've dreamt up this fable, this fairy story of the Indo-Pacific which is going to magically, uh, you know, sort of um, solve all these problems. Uh, I don't think the Indo-Pacific is going to uh, be a great supply route for China, uh, for, for, for Europe or America. I mean, it, it's just not. And India is not going to be a replacement in terms of manufacturing for China for a long time, nor is Vietnam. So I, I think there's an illusion. There's always an illusion of choice um, that there's sort of alternatives. And often there aren't alternatives. Europe its trading levels with China, Australia's iron ore exports to China went through the roof last year in one month, I think August, they were 20 billion Australian dollars, a record, despite terrible political relations. Yeah. United States, China uh, trade is also 600, 650 billion US dollars, uh, which is not a record, but you know, it's level. Uh, and it's still overwhelmingly uh, in China's favour, so the trade wars did not achieve a huge, in, you know, kind of impact on on that. Um, if we could change this, I think if Washington, uh, Brussels, and London could change this tomorrow, we could. But clearly, we can't, mm. and I don't think Ukraine and things like that will, you know, kind of impact on that. Yeah, it's a stark reminder. Strategy is one thing, but the reality is quite something else, right? Angus, I wanted to turn to you. Obviously, you know, during the Cold War, the genius of this uh, Nixon Kissinger uh, design of its relationship of America's relationship with China was to isolate Soviet Union. Now we talk about Russia again. You know, put your Kissinger expert hat on, Angus. You know, what would Kissinger say about what we are seeing today in this trilateral? dynamics? Well, Kissinger Expert is a dangerous title to have, but I will do my best. Um, well, I, I, I think Kissinger right now, if, 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 this, if this was Kissinger in the 1970s, Kissinger would be in Beijing right now trying to either pressure the Chinese to um, put pressure on Moscow or um, to try and almost open up a sort of second front of Conf not con conflict, not military conflict necessarily, but provide a um, another threat um, to to Putin, and because he very because very much had a sort of tripolar sense of the world in this point in this period, where um, and Nixon was very keen on this as well, just emphasising that it should always try and be it needed to be two against one, and that's I believe what Kissinger would be emphasising uh, right now. I mean. I think more, another interesting way of looking at it is to, trying to turn it on its head and sort of seeing other people trying to sort of emulate the Kissinger approach. Sort of, I think that was very much Macron's approach, Macron's style in the past few weeks when he um, reverse Kissinger goes try and orchestrate some grand bargain, and he's still trying to do that. He's Macron is probably the, the the figure in contemporary geopolitics who has the most Kissingerian ambitions, um, but. I, whether that actually comes to anything, I, I am seriously doubtful. The political and media circumstances are so different nowadays. And um, I'm not sure that Putin can be considered a Joe and Lai kind of type figure or anything like that. But it is fascinating to see the enduring legacies of Kissinger's trip um, and the way that it um, continues to dominate international politics. But it's also, I think, Important to note that it, in many, in sort of the, in a theoretical from a, in a, from a theoretical sense, the reverse side of Kissinger in Beijing is Chamberlain in Munich, 
And so this kind of foreign policy strategy can be quite dangerous if um, trying to orchestrate something through grand bargains and high level politics and great powers is a dangerous is a dangerous way to conduct politics, both in terms of it being a failure and ultimately history judging you poorly. So I think Kissinger um, was quite lucky in that it, that it all went well, that it's actually the um, the issue of Taiwan in particular was able to be sort of shunted aside with the Shanghai communique and it didn't uh, dominate uh, US-China relations in the 70s. So that's that's sort of how I would apply that that situation to the, um, the, the that, that, as I would apply that reference point to the contemporary situation, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, we've got a question about what Lee was talking about, a community of shared destiny. Obviously, this is a much loved phrase uh, of China's leader these days. Um, Rodrigo has this question. Um, some people say it's an empty slogan. Others say it's a strategy for Sinocentric world domination. What does it really mean? Lee, could you enlighten us on this, this, this phrase? What, what does that really mean? Especially, what does that really mean for Western audience? Um, thank you, Vincent, and uh, also thank you for the question. I think it's uh, good if people start to care about the phrase and uh, um, want to know about the phrase, it's a good start. Um, I, I'll say what I personally um, understand um, the phrase. Um, I think it's a continuation of China's strategy of peaceful development and uh, not seeking hegemony. Uh, it means China is anti-hegemony and will not take hegemony. Um, and a community with a shared future for mankind means that China and other countries are equal members of the community, uh, which means the um, entire international system. And no one is superior to other countries. And all countries should be equal and should, be, uh, should respect each other, um, should benefit and um, have win-win um, situation. So um, they, we should not um, we should not create conflicts with each other and should um, uh, retreat together in the broader interest of mankind. But uh, and this is this is what I what I know about it. Thank mm. you. I, ho I hope this answer you know more or less. I wanted to ask James. Um, so obviously, this is the Chinese view of you know peaceful development, as Lee said. Is there much buying from Western capitals, as as you see sitting here from London and you know studying U.S.-China grand strategy? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Is there any much buying um, to this you know share the future uh, mankind um, that this you know community of shared destiny, uh, this phrase uh, in Western capitals? when they think about, you know, Chinese grand strategy, Chinese, you know, intention? I think there definitely is to an extent. Uh, the best example of this is the Huawei deal done in the UK. So you think about the, you know, there were a lot of security implications and other things. I mean, the US threatened to potentially cut off certain uh, intelligence links with us over Huawei being involved in uh, the US infrastructure. But we sort of came to a, an agreement on that, that we would have some level of oversight, but we wanted to make sure that Huawei was included to an extent. And I think that's sort of indicative of the view that it really is London to Beijing. I mean, it's been said multiple times in the Belt and Road Initiative that the end, the end goal was London. So I think that gives, a, gives an indication of firstly Chinese uh, interest, but also I think that Europe obviously realizes that it is a market that the Chinese want to access further and that, I mean, they're not going to turn that down. They definitely want to develop some of these relationships. But we also just... know the fate of Huawei in this country, for example. Right? Well, yes, obviously it's not done quite as well as it might have otherwise, but I think it's it's not as bad as it could have been. It could There could have been the complete pushback on a lot of Chinese products, a lot of Chinese infrastructure like that and investment, uh, but it wasn't to the extent that uh, it shows that the West is willing to completely disengage and compete with China. Mm. 
Great. Thanks very much for your take. Um, we've got another question about uh, Western powers have criticized China for breaking WTO rules, and the WTO has been criticized for failing to respond to them adequately. Can the panel comment on this? Uh, in layman's terms, what are the rules China has broken? Are they legitimate claims? Does the WTO have the power to do anything about it? James, I think that falls into your orbit of uh, studying uh, economic statecraft. Yes, it, uh, it does to an extent, although I look a lot more at infrastructure investment than I do at trade, uh, I can cover this briefly. So my understanding of the WTO's rules broken were specifically tariffs on certain product. Now, I think there have been other things at different points in time. It uh, depends on whatever the question, when you end your meaning, what time scale you're meaning, because there have been a few different uh, in times. But I think the most recent one was it was the claim on tariffs, specifically of products coming in from Australia was one of the big ones that it said the broke, rules had been broken uh, on the amount of tariffs that had been placed on different produce and products that were coming into the country. And in which case, yes, the Chinese did not rescind on these. Uh, they still bought some of the product, but they looked to source it elsewhere. And does, I think that probably explains this most recent one. I think there are other times when the Chinese haven't broken necessarily WTO rules um, because, you know, it's it's legal, it's highly subjective, it could be argued. Uh, but in certain cases, especially the tariffs, I think that those are the cases you're talking about and you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a, a scholarly question from Sheldon, Sheldon Sun, who asks, as scholars, how do you approach truth when international politics is dominated um, by various media headlines, and what are your recommendations for the public? I think, Nicola, if I may take your uh, pick your brain on this, um, could you give uh, um, Sheldon some academic recommendation on this? How do you, as scholar, uh, cut through the noise and uh, look into truth? I don't like to use the term truth. <laughs> That's one way of avoiding it. Um, I think perceptions and um, uh, understanding the historical context, the psychological um, situation, um, the personal relations, all these things matter in, in getting a sense of perception of a, an event uh, and how there can be very different perceptions. In the case of US-China relations, um, you know, the 1996 Taiwan Strait crisis is a great example of where the truths and the perceptions um, were completely at odds and that, you know, that crisis could have been entirely avoided if they had understood better each other. Um, so in terms of the truth, um, I'm not sure um, that's the best way of looking at US-China relations. I think looking at emotions, looking at perceptions may be a better, um, mm. and, and, and in terms of a scholarly uh, study, a, a more fruitful um, understanding um, uh, as each countries have their own sense of the truth, as it were. And in, in the nuclear context, we can we can have a sense of material truth, right, through satellite imagery and so forth, but we may not understand the reasons um, for the things we see, right? And um, again, this word truth is, is probably more, pro more of a problem than a solution uh, in, mm. in, in, in the nuclear context. So um, I would say truth is, is a very dangerous word that I perhaps, um, very overtly and explicitly avoid um, when I look at these two countries. Mm -hmm. Now, we are running out of time. We have two more speakers later on. Um, I wanted to get the panel's view on what next? Let's look ahead. We have looked back at uh, this historic visit 50 years ago today. But what next for the US-China relations in such a evolving, fluid, and a complex geopolitical environment? Um, Kerry, would you, would you like to make a start, please? What's your take on the future? Yeah, I, I mean, um, it's unlikely that things will dramatically improve. Um, I don't think that they're going to have a big makeup. Um, we know the issues that are kind of, um, uh, you, you know, that, that they've put right at the front. Um, and I think the framework that, uh, that, that, that they've kind of articulated of, competitor, collaborator, adversary. I mean, the, 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 the Americans certainly, I think, believe this is workable. Um, I don't think the Chinese accept it. They don't accept that kind of division, but they're pragmatic. So 
I think, you know, the issue will be, there'll be two issues about this. One is how that framework, that tripartite framework um, evolves so that issues which might be competitive one day become collaborative the next and then adversarial sometimes the, the sort of next day. You know, this is a very dynamic model, but quite an unstable one. Um, and the second is alliances, who, you know, the Europeans and you know, the European Union, the British, Australians factor in this. And at what point they're going to disagree with America about where exactly China is a competitor and where it's a collaborator. We've already seen in the initial trade war in 2018, um, 2019, the Europeans kind of straying a bit from the Americans and trying to sort of create a more bespoke uh, China policy. They talk about, um, you know, more of strategic autonomy. They hope to achieve this. It's not easy because I think America is able still to put quite a lot of pressure on uh, Europe and, and, and the UK. Um, so I think this is going to be quite a kind of uh, turbulent period. I don't see any reason why that's um, going to stop. Mm. Uh, we have the framework. It's just how you implement it. And I mean, from China's point of view, presumably it will also continue to be quite frustrated by what it thinks are impediments to its freedom of action, particularly if and when it becomes the world's biggest economy. Mm -hmm. I think that cuts you nicely to a Chinese perspective. Li, uh, would you like to tell us from China's perspective, as you understand it, um, what is the future for the Sino-American relations? Li, are you there? Yes, sorry, I'm here. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I, I actually want to um, add a little bit on, uh, based on this question as well as on, um, I see another question uh, about the new Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to uh, explain a, a bit further. Um, I want to um, have the Cold War last century as reference. Um, there were there were three features of last Cold War or the Cold War. We hope it's the only Cold War, right? So uh, first is the fierce competition I, on ide of ideology, and second, uh, a comprehensive military confrontation, and third, um, economic independence and even isolation because uh, the United States and the Soviet Union um, they not only had few economic ties, but also established their own um, international economic systems. And today, accordingly, first, there is no, um, at least not yet, very obvious ideological competition between China and the United States. Um, competition should be mutual, but China has always been clear not to expert ideology to other countries and opposed the United States to do so. And secondly, there is um, no comprehensive military confrontation between the two countries. There are some military frictions between China and the United States in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, um, but China has no will to have military confrontation, as I said, against the United States or against any country. And finally, um, China and the United States are highly independent interdependent economically. So theoretically, um, rationally, and hopefully there will not be new Cold War. And um, there, there were modest hopes when, when Biden won US president and China US relation would, be, would get better as he was considered absolute opposite of Trump. And last February, um, Yang Jiechi, director of the Office of a Foreign Affairs Committee expressed the hope for a healthy and stable development of bilateral relations and China is willing to take joint efforts. However, it's yeah, quite de depressing um, because I read from a recent uh, American poll that the number of American people who like China in polls has dropped from 40% to 20%. So, um, mm, mm. It's, it's very likely, it, it won't be surprising and even likely that um, China-US relation is going to be worse in the future, but I think it, it, it will still be um, away from the bottom line of military confrontation. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you. Thank you for your take. I mean, one of the really interesting things observing U.S.-China relations is that we seem to be in this parallel world, meaning China articulates its um, intention pretty clear, pretty well, but. Washington doesn't seem to buy into China's view of the world. Um, that's the reality that, that we are in now. Nicola, I wanted to uh, go, come to you um, to take your wisdom on this. You know, during the Cold War, uh, nuclear weapons, you know, uh, the possible nuclear war was, you know, really something dominate, you know, the public discourse. Um, do you worry that um, you know this something like this is going to happen again as this power of competition um, enters a new phase? You know, especially there is quite a lot of uncertainty, of course. You know, the U.S. domestic situation, but certainly uh, it is no denying that the power of competition is going to intense. Uh, it is going to intensify in the decades to come. No. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, I think you're alluding to, I think, what have been recent fears over Taiwan in particular and, and um, you know, the United States and China very much, you know, it's a very low probable event that they would use intentionally or deliberately nuclear weapons. It would more happen as a result of misunderstanding and, and sort of an inadvertent uh, scenario. But, but still, the prospect is, is real in the way that it wasn't real really in the in the in the 70s and 80s just because of the pure numbers um of course you know the uh, china today and its nuclear capabilities its strategic military capabilities including those that are non-nuclear are far bigger today than they were several decades ago so um that that makes the prospect of even inadvertent um accidental conflict a hugely um, you know hugely worrying um which is why i think you know when we're talking about arms control and things like that, we should be probably pushing for things like confidence building measures, dialogue, um, very much bespoke dialogue, um, not you know big order issues perhaps, but mm -hmm. issues around how do you maintain um, communication to avoid escalation at sea, um, and uh, particularly uh, not just around Taiwan, but all the South China Sea, those kind of issues I think are what, what we need to be thinking about move, moving forward rather than former Cold War, um, mm. you know, uh, like for like things um, and having an ABM treaty of sorts, for instance, between the US um, and China uh, today. But in general, to answer your question, I, I'm fairly um, uh, positive in the sense that I think China still down, downplays significantly the nuclear element in its overall mm. military doctrine. And that's a, a, an overall positive. Um, it doesn't have a very um, sort of war fighting offensive approach still, despite the increases in modernization. Um, but I think there could be a lot more attempts by the United States and, and China to have uh, more communication and dialogue. And that would be, I think, beneficial to issues around Taiwan and, and, and other um, areas of concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicola. Um, Angus, what is your prediction for future? Uh, well, thank you. I, I, I... Quite honestly, I don't, I don't really have one. I'm not. I'm more a historian than foreign policy thinker, so I'd um, put that out there as the warning. But I, to be honest with you, I don't imagine much uh, content, much radically changing, particularly on the sort of political military stalemate, to want a better word. In the long term, I think that it will be in uh, sort of like tech and cyber and things, but also particularly on the questions of. Um, uh, di central, uh, uh, digital currencies from central banks and things and how um, the Chinese state sort of in um, how it relates to the large Chinese financial sector and how the, the US perceives the financial sector because I think the Evergrande's um, difficulties last year are a premonition of what could come not in necessarily in terms of a 2008 style crisis but if actually that the, these economics particularly the financial element will become an animating theme of the quotidian element to US-China relations. And you have the advent of new initiatives like central bank digital currencies and also cryptocurrencies and things that will expand the, expand the financial sphere of that and the, the um, respective states will need to keep up um, with that. And I don't necessarily believe that that will lead to conflict but it will, it, it will necessitate a particular form of cooperation in order to um, ensure the stability to, a, uh, to the emerging global digital financial sector. And that's what I imagine will be the greatest 
lesson going forwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting take. Uh, James, um, you study China-US relations in Central Asia. Give us a view from that part of the world, because this is not the part of the world that often make headlines when we talk about US and China relations, right? I think you are on mute. Sorry. Um, going forwards into the future, um, there's been a lot of calls recently uh, in, in the US side to start looking at Central Asia again. So I think there is definitely going to be some, as a new initiative announced, there's going to be some progress. They're already looking to increase uh, different relationship strategies. The C5 plus one is a very good example of that. Uh, that's been continued and they're trying to slowly up the ante on it. Uh, while simultaneously China, BRI 2.0, they're going to look to sort of push these things out again. They're making sure to once again engage with all the different countries and sort of assimilate both the national interests of the specific nations. Uh, and indeed, they're not just doing this in Central Asia, but Central Asia specifically I know about. They're speaking with all the governments and trying to figure out a new direction for the BRI because there have been problems recently. Uh, could Kazakhstan, sorry, pulled out of a 1.5 billion investment deal. Uh, and there's been other sort of rumblings as such, especially in the Central Asian region recently. So I think China is looking to reposition itself uh, the US is looking to position itself and it will be interesting to see if they come to competition because they haven't really so far, but there is the potential for this to occur. Mm -hmm. Great. A lot of food for thought. Thank you very much indeed to my panel, Carrie, Nicola, James, Lee and Angus. Um, let me hand this uh, um, hosting right to Zeno and Anna, uh, both of whom will have some further thoughts on this subject we are talking about today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. And thanks to everyone who has um, joined us today. And thanks to my colleagues uh, for being here. Um, yes, I'd like to perhaps draw some final thoughts and Anna will do the same. Uh, I think I have a bit of time. If I may break the protocol slightly, I'd like to just say something about Russia, given that it's uh, on the headlines. Um, I've been writing a commentary this morning um, in Italian for a, for a, for a new Italian newspaper. And basically I was trying to reflect on whether 50 years later we might uh, be able to see a uh, new new kind of uh, rapprochement, uh, but this time between the United States and Russia to isolate uh, China. Um, I think there is a lot of fantasy in this question. However, I just wanted to contribute to, to that first question of Russia that you, you received, uh, Vincent, earlier on, and by saying that I think there's been, uh, this idea has been in the mind uh, it's been a fantasy, or at least it's been in the mind of uh, people like Obama, Trump, and perhaps like Biden as well. It's been in the mind of few people in the United States over the last decade, at least. Of course, the fact that an idea exists doesn't mean that it's actually uh, practically uh, viable. And I think we all recognize there are a lot of challenges. Uh, but who knows, perhaps in 10 years' time, we will do this again, and that might be uh, another uh, topic for uh, discussion. But anyway, if we go back to um, the overall discussion that we had today, I thought I could just say a few words uh, that might relate back to also to the issue of pragmatism, which uh, Kerry, Kerry Brown uh, dealt with, and Nicola addressed the question on, on about truth. I think I can also uh, relate it to that. And from a perspective of uh, international order, which is normally the lens I, I try to uh, use when looking at international relations. Um, and so I think what's striking um, a lot of us uh, nowadays is the fact that, uh, well, Nixon and Mao were so pragmatic and so willing to reopen relations between the US and China, and above all to accept, they were willing to accept the fact that there was socio-political diversity, internal diversity uh, between the US and China. Um, and this, and Vincent, we have discussed this um, a few days ago, and um, uh, this has been reminded by a Chinese, by the Chinese Minister for Foreign Affairs recently, uh, the fact that 
central, probably the backbone of the Shanghai communique uh, in 1972 was the fact that China and the US were willing to respect each other's uh, political uh, differences in terms of uh, institutional systems. Um, clearly, in recent years, uh, this respect uh, is not there. And so I guess that's why we're so fascinated by uh, the pragmatism uh, of the time. Um, and I, I think we are not going to see, we're not going to see it for the time being, as it was alluded to, and we're actually going to see some sort of partial uh, decoupling in, 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 in different areas or in different facets of uh, the relationship. Um, and I think there are good reasons to say this. There are uh, several examples we, ca we could make, uh, but I want to start from a statement of two China-based colleagues who have read recently uh, in a recently published uh, book. And they are saying that we're heading towards a, a world order where there will be uh, to some people, uh, uh, sorry, where what to some people it means uh, world water diplomacy, to other people uh, means uh, harmony. And so the two truths, right? Um, and I, I thought this was a very uh, controversial statement. Um, I get that, but actually I feel it really captures, captures really well uh, the sort of international order, the sort of divergence that we're seeing and that we're going to see. And it's something we saw uh, a couple of years, two, three years ago already inside the United Nations when uh, we saw two groups of countries uh, signing a letter about the way China handles uh, the issue of human rights, uh, saying completely different things, one attacking China, the other endorsing uh, uh, the behavior of China. Um, and, and we also saw, and this was reminded earlier on, uh, China and Russia uh, delivering a joint statement uh, in Beijing uh, almost a month ago now, on the 4th of February, essentially saying um, there is the American democracy, but there is also the Russian democracy, and there is also the Chinese democracy. And I think this is taking us beyond the US-led liberal international order, but it's not just Russia or China, it's also uh, the United States. We talked about the B3W of uh, Biden, Build Back Better World of Joe Biden earlier on. And I think that, that framework is about organizing a coalition of uh, like-minded countries to achieve some decoupling with regard to uh, some sensitive, some strategic industry, sensitive uh, areas of uh, domestic and, and foreign policy. And so also the US is somehow going beyond um, uh, uh, the liberal international order. Um, contrary to the past, uh, however, uh, and this also was reminded uh, earlier on, uh, where the China and the US are struggling to find an agreement because uh, there's no common threat. There's not, a, there's not a, a, a Russia, a Soviet Union this time. Um, and yes, Professor Brown talked about uh, how, um, yeah, the fundamentals of the Sino-Russian relationship are actually, might actually be weak, of course, and I agree. For the time being, in the short terms, though, uh, this, this will probably uh, lead to a healthy sort of cooperative relationship. But anyway, just to, to sum up, um, decoupling might be worrying. Uh, however, might sound worrying. However, I think if this relationship has gone wrong also because of the economic interdependency between uh, the two countries, and I think this is the case, uh, well, I wonder whether I'm speculating here, but I wonder whether the coupling might bring some, might be act actually be a positive development in the relationship, might actually decrease the tension in, in some areas. I, I hope so. Um, and even if there wasn't anything positive about the coupling, I think uh, there certainly is an element of realism, uh, an element of truth uh, in the sense that, um, the, 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 the hopes for integration and, uh, between US and China in the past and the hopes for the democratization in China, I think they were based more on, on ideology rather than uh, actually an accurate 
balance the sober assessment of the two countries and of, of the relationship. Uh, so I guess this is my way of seeing these uh, uh, the negative things that we see today in a more positive light. Um, thank you, Vincent. Uh, I guess I'll hand it back to you before going to Anna. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Zeno. Um, Anna, do you have any closing remarks on this topic? Um, uh, thank you, Vincent. Um, yeah, I'm just here to close the event. Um, and because the discussions around US-China relations have become ever more saturated in both civic and academic discourse. Um, and so, like, like our panelists were saying, their interactions have become even more tense over the recent years. So moving forward, it is likely that this trend will continue for at least the foreseeable future. Um, and these two great powers have um, the global weight to influence global governance and financial markets from across regions around the world. So I hope that, you know, um, as the saying goes, it is important to appreciate nuance in, in foreign policy making because the devil is always in the details. Um, and so it is quite important that hopefully this roundtable has been an opportunity that we were able to move nuance beyond the borders of academia and into civic discourse. Um, firstly, I, I'd like to thank, uh, take this time to thank our chair, Vincent Nee of The Guardian for being able to direct this timely discussion and drawing from his very own expertise and not just as an experienced journalist in the field, but also as a presenter of the recent BBC documentary on Henry Kissinger's first visit to China. This roundtable has also uh, given us a chance to delve deeper into how we got to where we are today when it comes to US-China relations, um, with, with, with many thanks to our privileged speakers who share their time with us today. Professor Kerry Brown especially has been able to offer us with an, an overview of the two countries' relations since the Nixon-Mao era, not just as a renowned scholar in the field, but also as with the added value of his diplomatic experiences as a British diplomat serving in Beijing many years ago. And whilst Sino-American economic competition has been a popular talk of the town, Dr. Nicola Leveringhouse has also been able to give her a fascinating take about the importance of US-Russia relations on missile defenses and their ability to influence China's very own position in nuclear arms race. And our PhD students have, have also been able to offer their research insights from the angle of both US and PRC. Angus has delved deeper into the significance of uh, behind the original trip of Kissinger and Nixon to Beijing and the dynamics and legacies of that mid-century detente between the two big powers. James in particular also gave us a comparative view of Beijing and Washington's global economic investments, the return of bilateral tension between the two countries and potential competition in Central Asia. On the China side of things, Li Lin has specifically been able to talk about the ongoing controversies surrounding Winter Olympics held in Beijing um, and where that fits into the conversation regarding the new Cold War. We hope that today's conversation will produce more roundtable discussions of this sort in the future and more importantly, make nuanced and informed debates surrounding these two great powers more of a norm in public discourse moving away from strawman arguments that many of us are inclined to do so on the topic. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for being able to do so very comprehensively as we have heard from them today. I'd like to thank Zeno, Lizzie and Hannah, our colleagues from the School of Security Studies and the Lao China Institute for turning today's event into fruition. And from, for more events like this, please do explore our website to subscribe to our newsletters. Thank you everyone for joining with us today and I hope to see you all again in our next event. Goodbye.